great. I love, I love, let's have some good times. That's what all it's right. all about. Great. Bye, everyone. All righty. So, all right. Deep breath in. Hey, welcome back to the Awesome Life Podcast. I'm Karen Stultz, your host. And today, as every podcast that we have, I have the most awesome, awesome guest, Allison Hall. I am so excited for you to meet her so that uh, she can share her wisdom and her resources with you to help you be your awesome best. The fact is that this podcast is for women in transition. And I know that some of you know exactly what you want, but you may not have the resources. Or you may know um, maybe what you might like, but you're not sure it's for you. Or maybe you have no idea. So my guests and I give you those resources, those tips, those tricks, those inspiration to be the awesome self that is you. And today, Allison, uh, Allison with one L, very special very special one l uh and we'll talk about that later in the show why why i mentioned that specifically but let me let me read to you a little bit about allison and who she is and what she does uh she is the founder of change agent coaching for women and she's a passionate reinvention specialist after 25 years of building a traditionally successful corporate career she reinvented herself to become her own happy boss, launching several successful businesses and parlaying her professional experience as a CPA and a corporate strategist into helping women navigate transitions, build businesses, and create their dream lives. Her mission is to inspire people to confidently lean into their strengths, find their purpose, dump the shoulds, and the self-doubt and reinvent themselves so they can create the lives that they want and truly deserve and as she likes to say it's never too late to reach for a dream if you only have one life to live you better get cracking <laughs> i love that right. allison so welcome thank you so much for joining us on the awesome life podcast Thank you so much, Karen. I'm so happy to be here and have the conversation. Uh, I love listening to your podcast, so to be here in person is great. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I, I, I love the fact that you ha have successfully been able to move out of that corporate world, which is for so many of my clients and for the people I talk to, it's a soul sucking world out there quite often, unless you have a fantastic crew around you and, and uh, leadership that is outstanding. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be the case a lot. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Not everybody is that fortunate. I mean, there are some people, but it's not like it was back in the 1950s when you, you know, maybe had a career and you stayed at one company for years and years and you were appreciated for, for everything that you brought to the table. Nowadays, we're all kind of on some level disposable and that can be soul sucking. Yeah. Yeah, it really can. So I apologize our, our communication. It's very warm here right now. And the uh, the internet is being a little wonky, but I know this is such an important conversation for so many women. How did you do that transit? You were in a C you were a CPA, correct? Right, right. Yeah. So I'm a CPA by you know education, I suppose. In the corporate world, I wasn't functioning as a CPA per se, but I was in the financial end of things in you know Fortune 500 companies. And as you mentioned, 25 years, you know, I put in my time, I, I did all the late hours in my youthful times, you know, 60, 80 hour a week consulting roles. And, and then I moved into the corporate world. And it was never that I didn't, you know, appreciate 
the roles that I had. And I, it wasn't that I didn't think I was growing. It's just, it got to a point where whatever it was that I was doing just didn't seem to have value to me anymore. I knew it had some modicum of value out in the world wheel. No matter how far up you get, you're still a cog in a wheel and you were or a cog, you can't kid yourself to. You start to think kind of in that vein, you think, well, if I could be easily replaced, what diff you know, what value am I really adding? Maybe I could be doing something else. And that's kind of, you know, I know some people, people have different experiences. Some people burn out, you know, they just uh, burn the candle at both ends from home life to work and, and trying to participate in their communities and do all the things and you just kind of burn out. I didn't really have burnout. I tell people it was kind of more of just rust out, you know, <laughs> so you can just imagine just, you know, like the Tin Man, you just sort of rust out. <laughs> and I knew I had to find something else to to keep my mind busy and to make me feel as if I was adding value to the world in some way. Yeah, yeah, because our, our listeners, that's all all we want to do. And in so order the first thing I went, well, you know, I would love to say that I had a dramatic end story, but I didn't. I didn't have a dramatic story that took me from corporate world to the next world. I just made a decision and left. That's fantastic. It really is because the truth is that uh, it doesn't have to be a dramatic story. It does not have to be down and out and living under a bridge to, <laughs> to make make a huge difference in this world. Uh, and and myself, I tried I tried Allison to come up with my story that was. Oh yeah, I was so down and out and I felt like suicide and I did this and I said, you know what? I had a damn good life and I'm proud of it. So why are you trying to change your story? Come on. Exactly. We, we are people and we all have our own needs and desires and and it's important to be authentic in yourself. Absolutely, I agree. And you know, I know that your audience is made up of people who are interested in transition or they're in the process of or they're thinking about it. And I was, you know, before we were chatting and I was really thinking about that concept. And you know, the thing of it is is that we are all always in transition. From the time that we're born till the time that we, you know, leave this earth, we're, we're always transitioning. But but what I was thinking about was particularly for your your audience we become acutely aware of it at a certain point in life after you've done some one thing for a long time and maybe you're transitioning from as we're talking about you know moving from a corporate career or, or something like that or maybe you're getting a, a divorce or your kids are leaving the home those are the times when we become acutely aware of transition it's happening all the time but it just seems it can either seem overwhelming or dire or just hugely important that we make all the right decisions. And yet throughout our lives, we're always transitioning, always making incremental decisions. And even the big ones are not much different. I mean, there's only so much change you can make at one point or in one day. So it's always incremental things. You know, so we're, we're kind of talking about things don't have to be dramatic. I feel that way about change. It doesn't have to be dramatic. In fact, the more dramatic it is, the less likely you are to see it through all the way. If that makes sense. Yeah. Agreed. Absolutely. And doing those baby steps and looking back and just saying, hey, I've grown. How cool is that? Mm -hmm. I really like that. And I like that feeling and I'm going to keep going. But for you, 25 years, it must have been a little bit of a challenge working for someone to being your own boss. Oh, sure, absolutely. It was a huge challenge. I mean, just right down to the get up and go do something, right? Just to give context, the first role that I gave myself was I had always been interested in physical fitness and I, on the side, had become a personal trainer just for my own, you know, it was that was kind of my little hobby. I decided to use that as my springboard for that was going to be my first foray into being my own boss. Well, it, it's more than a notion to be your own boss when you're you're the one who has to make all the decisions and you have to execute everything and you have to make the right decisions and you have to execute in the right way and you, you have to sort of engage the right people. So it was, it was a fascinating endeavor. And, and you also have to, unless you're, you know, personally wealthy, you also have to make sure that 
you're earning an income. So yeah, I, but, but what I will say is that once I walk, because I remember somebody asking me about this when I was about I don't know, six to 10 months into my first entrepreneurial endeavor, they asked me, you know, well, how do you feel? And I mean, I know you, you always have to get clients and you always have to do this and that. I mean, do you feel like you're ever nervous and you feel like you want to go back to corporate? And, and my immediate answer was no. It was like a door closed behind me. I didn't hate it. I didn't resent it, but it had served its purpose and it was in the rear view and I was moving forward. And I, and it made me feel good that even though at that point I was still struggling to get as many clients as I needed to be, you know, profitable. I was happy with the decision marketing. I was working day and night for myself and my decisions were going to make or break me. And there's something kind of great about that as someone who's, you know, like so many of your listeners who have been in a corporate environment where you come up with great ideas, but somebody else comes up with an idea that doesn't seem to match up, but for whatever reason, their idea is the one you have to run with and you got to get on the train and follow along. You know, that's, it's a far cry from being your own boss. That's for sure. It is that, it is that. And did you, so you didn't have any doubts about or any thought about going back and getting a job with somebody else? Not really. I mean, I'm, I'm sure I toyed with the thought of it, but not even so far as to get on an app and look for it, look for a role. Mm -hmm. I just kind of put my head down. Uh, to be fair, I did give myself, I, I told myself initially, let's give this particular, you know, see how it pans out. And I think that is one thing when I do talk to clients who are thinking about becoming entrepreneurs, you have to be realistic about expectations. I'm not one to blow smoke toward anyone. And so I would never tell somebody to, yes, go on and quit your job. And in two months, you'll, you'll be profitable. Maybe <laughs> if you're really lucky, I mean, maybe, but that's not realistic. And so I tell my clients who are looking to make that kind of a change, you have to be prepared to have that amount of money, you know, a year's worth of, it might be less income than you were earning, but have that much saved up so that you can live at least eat and pay your necessary bills for a year. But I told myself, you know, if this doesn't pan out, I'm either going to do something else or really think seriously about, you know, to be honest, I, I never really thought seriously about going back to corporate. I just kind of thought something adjacent. I will become a consultant of some kind doing, you know, consulting in the field that I was already familiar with from corporate. But I never thought I would go back and have real bosses. Okay. So you are going to keep your independence no matter what. Yes. That was not even a question, but it was a case of how you are going to make this all work. So you started off as a physical fitness trainer and right. that is not what you're doing now. So That is not what I'm doing now. <laughs> that's that's very true. No, that's that's where I started and and again it was because of for doing the activity, what I didn't have any, which is what it grew into, because I ended up, because when you think about, uh, it doesn't take long to, if you're doing fairly well, it doesn't take long to fill up all of your day slots, or as many day slots as you're willing to fill and still have some time of your own. And so I ended up, you know, bringing on other trainers, and inevitably, I had to become the boss of all of the trainers. So at the end of the day, what I was running was a physical fitness company, which is great, but that wasn't, you know, I realized upon doing it, but that, that I didn't have a passion for that. That wasn't what I really wanted to do. So I was fortunate enough to be able to ultimately one of the trainers did have a passion and I was able to sell the business to her. It's not one of those great big, you know, I sold to Google or something like that. No, I, I sold to another woman who wanted to be an entrepreneur and there's a great opportunity for her and I uh, so it was a win-win for us and it gave me the opportunity to move on to something else that I had passion about which was real estate so I started a real estate firm a real estate investment firm and I still run that on the back end now but also I have a mind for finance so I kind of swirled back around to my CPA uh, endeavors 
it sounds as if none of these things have anything to do with one another, but they actually do. Because in my real estate world, I met women who also wanted to invest in real estate, but I also met women who were getting divorced and that sort of fueled their desire to make money in other ways. Being a CPA, I found out that there's a, a certification called Certified Divorce Financial Analyst. So I became certified <laughs> in, in the ability to help people. Hence, I started another business, which was just that. Then I discovered that the women, I, I worked almost essentially with women. The women that I was helping, I was, you know, I was helping them prepare for divorces, get through divorces, go to court, you know, have all their financial ducks in a row, and also prepare for the future. That's when I discovered that the divorce transition is not unlike any other kind of transition. And so, I, you know, I got into, I was coaching them and didn't even realize it. And I thought, well, I should probably get some training in this regard. So, you know, I got certified as a couple of different kinds of coaches. And then I realized, well, I can take this show on the road to the next business to help women in a wider uh, vein. So that's how I ended up with change agent coaching. And I think I mentioned to you before we began taping that uh, we, I, I have a new endeavor that is adjacent to this one. It's called The Boldest Me. And I teamed up with a psychologist partner of mine. She's a clinical psychologist. And she wanted to help people more actively in more of a coaching way. But again, she's a clinical psychologist. And we thought, well, let's, and we had been referring clients back and forth, you know, over a number of years. So we decided to get together and, and we're more facilitators. We run uh, group programs for women. Uh, we help people kind of overcome their inner critic issues and saboteurs and gain confidence and do all kinds of things. So it's great fun. I'm glad to have a teammate in crime. Uh, so yeah, that's what we're doing now. Oh, well, you know, as I always say, fun is number one in my world. And having somebody to have fun with, it just, it, it is. It, it's so great that way. And yeah. we um, don't recognize the fact sometimes that working totally alone is part of the solo entrepreneurship. And that can be tough. Mm -hmm. And the fact truly is that you cannot work totally alone and have it have, have a successful business absolutely yeah it's just not because again we were talking about having to wear all the hats that's great you get to make all the decisions but i am not particularly tech savvy i mean i'm not an idiot but i that's not my it takes me longer than it should to figure out tech things i'm not great with uh creative things like creating brand you know, marketing and things like that. So you do have to, you have to learn how to, you know, leverage other people's skills. Sometimes when you're first starting out, I mean, I'm kind of going sideways here, but sometimes when you're first starting out, it can be so overwhelming and you think, but I don't have an extra dollar in my coffers to hire somebody to do. So you are adding, you're able to add value to somebody else. They're very often willing to add value, you know, for what you need and that's how gosh i did that so many times when i was first starting out just i will give you this if you could give me that you know and women do that very well i found it's it's a barter system and and indeed it has to it that's a very slippery slope however yeah. if it works for both of you and that is what you have to be clear on is this serving me as much as it is serving them and do a joint venture is absolutely being able to say, we are jointly making this happen and I am getting more out of this than they are. And they feel the same way that they're getting more out of it than you are. So it, that, absolutely. that's my Agreed. definition right. of a joint yes, venture. Yes, because, agreed. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly because at the end of the day, you're both running you know, for-profit organizations. This isn't, you know, here you can have some okra and I'll give you some carrots kind of a situation. Exactly, exactly. And you, you, you really are, are trying to both make money. And yeah. you, you definitely need to have that, um, that, that heart technology, but 
also now you're starting this new venture with your new partner and congratulations i Thank love you. it i love it um do you do that uh, you're following a business plan i are you it's not yes. just a shake of the hand and say hey, oh no let's no. Do this. no we yes we, we have an actual partnership agreement and um and she still has her practice i still have my businesses this is one endeavor that we're doing together and yes but it all is all very official professional and personally but um but no business is business for sure yeah so what steps would you advise someone who is considering leaving the corporate world to become an entrepreneur what what uh, steps would you advise for them yeah i think i think there are two things two types of people that i tend to see people that i work with or just know there are those who follow their a passion that they have And there, then there are those who, and who, you know, I mentioned that if, if my first endeavor had failed, I would have considered consulting. So that's one thing that I see a lot of, particularly women, do. But I mostly work with women, so that's who I see. They'll come from their corporate environment and move into taking those specific skills into a consulting environment. That's brilliant. It makes great sense. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, you already have the skill set. And very often, you know, if you're not in some sort of, you know, non-compete circumstance, very often you at least have access to a pool of potential, you know, clients. Um, so that's one of the easiest, I won't, nothing is easy, but that's one of the simplest, most straightforward ways that people, I think that people can go about, you know, starting a soft landing spot. And the, then I mentioned the people who follow their passion. Those are people, in my mind, who, you know, have been doing one thing. Maybe it's in finance or marketing or, you know, HR, and they pick something that's wildly different. That ends up being a little more difficult unless you've had it as a side gig or a hobby, you know, a solid hobby for a number of years. For the same reasons that become a con become a, a consultant can be easier because you don't necessarily have a membership or an audience or, or a consumer base very often what you are interested in has you haven't tested it yet so you don't know what, if it's going to succeed you have to start from scratch with a business plan um, and the, one of the biggest mistakes I find people who are more passionate than you know than skillful in being an entrepreneur is that they don't test the marketplace to see if what it is that they want to do is something that people are willing to pay for because mm -hmm. your family may be wildly enthusiastic about what you do it doesn't mean that anyone beyond that you know anyone else is actually going to pay you what you think you deserve for it so i think that testing the market first by having a side gig a side hustle if, if it's a passion project i think that's best to determine so that you can determine whether or not it's a hobby or an actual business idea mm. and what would be the first step to be able to do that how how would somebody find out if their their passion i mean i love knitting no i don't but some people love knitting <laughs> what uh would be the first step for them to find yeah, out maybe you have crafts or or uh you, know, you make handbags or, or something physical Website is the obvious choice. Shopify, some of the, you know, websites that, that focus on retail sales. Um, so setting up your business in, in that way first before you, I'm just talking about before you quit <laughs> your, your main source of income. That's an easy way to test the market. If you have a knowledge based thing, you can always create a course and put it out there on one of the, you know, course content websites where those things are sold. You can put it on one of the ones where you won't make a lot of money, but you can get an indication of whether somebody is interested in it. Um, there's so many ways to try out a business. Even we created meetups. 
where you got people who are interested in this particular topic, like, okay, here's an example. One of my clients um, was interested in, it made uh, these terrariums that kind of whimsical terrariums, okay? And you think to yourself, okay, well, that's weird. But it's not because you'd be surprised because I had to do my research. You'd be surprised at how many people are interested in making them or owning them. Okay, so you can find a lot of places to buy them online. But, but you're not necessarily, there's not a huge market to make a lot of money for it. Long story short, we wanted to see if there was, a, if there was an opportunity for her to build her brand and her business through teaching people, but she couldn't figure out how to get in front of folks. So she started a meetup. Go figure. Started a meetup group, got people to come into that free, and then kind of advertised these clinics she was going to have, these workshops that she was charging for. Again, long story, very longer. She just came, but she built, you know, built a following and then started a blog. I mean, there's just so many things you can do before you. Yes, does it take a lot of time? Absolutely, but if, you, if you're passionate about something, that's also a litmus test, I'll just throw that in. If you get tired and burnt out really quickly over something that you've chosen, it probably wasn't for you. And something better out there for you. Absolutely. I love that. You have to, it, it's a, you have to feel it, don't you? You have to feel this passion inside of you and recognize when you do find yourself saying, I'm not too sure about this, to really look at it and to really feel where it is in your body. Is it because things are not growing as quickly as you want them to? Is it because you are getting tired of this? Is it because you don't have the health? What is it about it? And if you had plenty of money coming in, and if you had the the resources and, and assistance and, and health um, to, to be there for you, and you had everything you needed, are you still passionate about getting this out in the world? Because things happen. Look at us today. We're having tech issues. It's okay. We are right. both tech people. We are working on the internet and yet things happen. Absolutely. Should, yes. Should, should we stop what we're doing? No, don't stop what we're doing. Right. But, right. but if you don't have passion, I, yeah. And I think that, I think that when you really prepare, you know, I'm a, I'm a big preparation person. So, any endeavor that I start starts with a business plan. It doesn't have to be, you know, monumental. And I don't need, you don't necessarily need to take months to create it. But that's a great litmus test as well. As you're going through all the steps of the business plan, and you start to think about all the things that need to go into this. Yeah, that's a, you know, hmm, do I really want to do all of these things? Or maybe I'm interested in one of these things. Nothing wrong with that either. Maybe you can you can still do this, but maybe you need to bring other people in who have an interest. Maybe you're not even interested in being the CEO of a company that you've come up with. Nothing wrong with that either. Everybody has a role. It's just a matter of I love I love what you're saying though. You know, you really have to kind of stop, sit quietly with yourself and contemplate how you really feel about what it is that you're doing or about or what you're about to do. And be honest with yourself. And sometimes we do do things just because we think other people will think poorly of us or, well, we started it, we should finish it, you know, all those sorts of things, all the shoulds that, you know. All the shoulds, yeah. yeah. The shoulds, have tos, and need tos, we definitely want to take a second look at. If that is the, the verbiage that is coming out of your mouth, it's something that we have to take a look at. I know I had a, a client at one point who, he, he was a uh, international skateboarder. He mm -hmm. loved skateboarding and he went everywhere doing skateboards and skiing and snowboarding. And then uh, he, he said, you know, that's, I want to open a business. I know all about it. I want to open a business. I want to sell skateboards, snowboards. And, and I, I, all right, so let's make a business plan. Oh. 
if I do all the things that are needed to make and sell <laughs> these, I will never be able to go skateboarding or snowboarding again. Right, right. Yeah. So I think I'll go into partnership and make a pizza place. And then I can just have some fun skateboarding and snowboarding. <laughs> Pick what you love. That's right. He knew himself. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it didn't come immediately. It was like, yeah, I have a passion for skateboarding, snowboarding. And yeah, that's great. And you are right. great at it. But is that what you want to do? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, um, uh... I'm sure you're familiar with this, that concept of ikigai, you know, a Japanese concept of it. It's sort of loosely translates to passion, but the, but it has to do with, um, you know, your passion in life kind of thing. So it's the it's the the nexus, the place where your passions. Your skills with the four kind of intersects. And sometimes people who have strong passions get caught out, just like your skateboarder, they get caught out there and think that this is something they want to do. And, but the skills to do those things, they don't necessarily have those. And that's okay. You can always get skills, but you have to have the desire to become skilled in being a, you know, a retailer or a accountant or whatever, all the things he was going to need to be in order to run this skate shop or, you know, boarding shop. And then the world needs to need it. That was my concern with the with the whimsical terrariums. Does the world need us? Come to find out, yes, apparently. And then is somebody willing to pay? You know what you need to get paid for it. So when you look at that, and it, you know, kind of visual. So and I think of a little picture of that. That keeps me grounded in terms of my endeavors and things I want to do. Am I really passionate about it? Do can I do it? I try not to get too hung up on the canopy because we can always figure out a way. But do I want to figure out a way is much more important. That's more important. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I always say that if if you have the thought, it is possible for you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it's possible for you if you have the thought. Howsomever, simply because you have the thought does not mean it is for you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and that's okay. And that's so many okay. things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Absolutely. Well, Allison, I love this. So tell us more about your new venture with your your partner and, and tell me again the name of it. It's called the boldest me dot the com. Boldest me, I love yes. it. Yes. Yeah. And it was because we were having convers it, it's all about being passionate too, because we had passionate conversations about how we want to help women be their boldest selves. And that's how the name came about. We really didn't spend a lot of time kind of, you know, workshopping names or whatever. Bold was all that. We wanted to help people that are like us who have transitioned from this or that or who are thinking about new ways of doing things know that they're su succumbing to their inner critic all the time, or they know they're succumbing to the voices in their heads all the time, and they can't seem to get out of their own way. And so part of the, you know, the very core of what we're doing is she and I both went through a program with, um, I don't know if you've read the book, Positive Intelligence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Right. So we went through the head of that organization, um, Shirzad Sharman, he runs a coaching program. And it's amazing because it's app-based, but it's also human-based. And so without belaboring the point, it helps you to realize you know, and really appreciate when your little saboteurs, it, you take a, take a test to find out who in your head is like rancoring you the most. And you try to find ways to tame it. It kind of involves a lot of mindfulness, but not in a way that's preachy or odd or anything like that. It's just sitting quietly and thinking about circumstances. But anyway, there's a whole app and we just went crazy for it. And we're individually are not people who just fall for the next fad. And we thought this is something we really want to incorporate in both of our practices. Why don't we incorporate it together and help more people in a, in kind of a
know what we're talking about. Um, because it's helped each of us. We do it. I, I know that I, ha I have a tendency to be an avoider and I have a tendency to overthink things. And just the practice of examining who's talking to me in my head and why and trying to think more sagely about decision making, it's, it's helped me endlessly. So that's what we're up to. Well, fantastic. Yeah, that is absolutely amazing uh, to be able to help people figure that out. Because honestly, if, if we are not achieving our success, if we are not achieving the lifestyle that we want to have, that we, you know, if you can picture that lifestyle, it's yours for the having. But we need to get some things set in place. And if you're not achieving it, it is important to go to that voice that you hear and become more aware of what is directing you and and right. when was it and who is it and then just clear it out. Once, exactly. Exactly. Once we bring that that um, subconscious self talk to the conscious and the conscious starts hearing oh when i say this all i hear is that and then go into okay when did you first hear that who said that absolutely yeah and, agreed and then just clear it away and find the forgiveness and the love towards them and just simply clear it away and the nice thing is it doesn't have to take a long time. It doesn't, it doesn't. And it doesn't have to hurt. Right. You and if you just think about the numbers of thoughts that we have every day, we know we all have our millions of thoughts and the percentage of them that are negative thoughts that we're not even consciously aware of, you know, it's, it's overwhelming. So when you kind of start taking note of the thoughts in your head mm -hmm. and then, and then, well, I, when I talk with people, I, I think I try to frame it in, well, if you heard a negative, you know, what did you hear? Well, I'm not going to be able to get another job. If I quit this one, I'm never going to get another job. Well, how, how can you reframe that? Because that's the thing that's going, the loop that's in your head. Just because it was in your head doesn't mean it's true. It's just a thought. It's just a poof of a thought. Mm -hmm. what's, what's something else that could you could say about the same circumstance? Well, I'm smart. I mean, I've always gotten jobs before never really been unemployed for very long. So I'm sure I could probably support myself. I mean, that's just a reframe, but we have to consciously do that. And sometimes I, I suggest starting with, if, if you're having a hard time hearing what those things are, sometimes start with the conversations you're having with other people, just your closest friends and the conversations that you bring up and the tone that you bring, listen to yourself talking out loud to others, just as you do, what you hear, somebody talking to you and you're thinking, wow, that's kind of a negative attitude, or wow, she doesn't really think very much of herself. Do that to yourself when you're talking out loud, and then it becomes easier to hear what you're saying in your own head. Oh, for sure, for sure. The other thing I love are the affirmations, uh, because the affirmations are wonderful and can be very beneficial. I don't use them very much, because I recognize the, the self-talk that occurs with those affirmations, such mm -hmm. as um, you can say, I am a millionaire a hundred times over. And if you are barely meeting your bills, you're going to hear that self-talk say, uh, yeah, no. Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> that was a perfect example. That's so funny. That's true. Right. So uh, you're never going to be a millionaire with that self-talk. So you shift that affirmation, as you were saying, you know, reframing it a little bit to, I am taking daily steps to become a millionaire. Absolutely. And that circles us back around to what you were talking about in the beginning about small steps, right? It's incremental is better than nothing at all, right? Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it also, it builds your confidence when you're able to do some things successfully and you, you build those blocks. Okay, I took an action, made it, made it, made it. And then when, so that when you do inevitably fall down, because we all do, at least you're able to get back up. You have some resilience because you know that you have a history of being successful. You know, I've built up some, it's like with little kids. If they 
if we let them just start learning to walk when, when they were just born, they'd probably never get to walk because they would give up. You'd say, well, this is too hard. But we let them get a little hulk on themselves before <laughs> before they start to learn to walk. And then they get a little success and then they build on that. And that's, that's all we are is big little babies, you know, just taking steps, keep moving along. That that's what we are. Uh, everyone, everyone needs to learn and to be patient and and be patient with themselves and recognize, as you say, the the baby steps and congratulate yourself. Pat yourself on the back. All right. So I I say it quite often. Dang, I'm going back down the tubes again. I thought I had this covered. I thought this self-talk this negative talk was a thing of the past i know better and then oh wait a minute i noticed it a whole lot faster this time so i can shift it mm. i can turn that around like that now so hey good job all right exactly. so you're going down but you recognize it faster so you don't go down to the same depths and exactly that is the baby step to move forward and to feel good and have somebody on your side like like Allison or or myself to to help you stay accountable to recognize and to celebrate celebrate when you are making those forward strides because those baby steps do turn into big strides so if you are searching for someone to help you recognize or maybe do those uh, basic transitional steps to move from corporate into your own entrepreneurship, which we both think is the best way to go. Uh, yeah, reach out to Allison. And how can they reach out to you, Allison? Sure. I, I answer all of my emails. So as you pointed out, it's Allison with one L at changeagentcoaching.com um, and yes check out our the boldest me website and uh, you know if you're on linkedin i'm not on a lot of social media other than linkedin so it's allison hall coach women which is pretty straightforward fantastic and yes i will have all of that in the show notes below this uh so do reach out to allison and i did promise that we would talk a little bit about why i'm so passionate about meeting Allison's with one L. I did not realize it. I don't know about you, Allison, but for me, oftentimes I don't recognize things until it's brought to my attention. And my son's partner, Allison, uh, said, yeah, I am Allison with one L. And if you try and find any of those cute little name tags or anything that says Allison with one L, you're doing a whole lot better than I am. Uh, and I started looking because I never noticed it. Now, my daughter is Allison with two L's. So I was always finding those name tags everywhere. You know, the things you put on your doors, Allison's room, Allison's car, you know, all of this. And I couldn't find Allison's with one L. And what it it struck me as is that Allison's with one L are so amazingly, remarkably unique and giving and caring. I love Allison's with one L. So I knew I would love Allison Hall with one L. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll take it for all of the Allison's winner. There you go. There you go. Well, thank you. Thank you again for joining me for the Awesome Life podcast. And I will have all of the contact information for Allison in the show notes. And do reach out to her because uh, it's important to be bold in your life. It's important to have awesomeness in your life. So be sure to reach out. and like subscribe send comments i love to see the comments and i do uh, answer all emails as allison does it's kind of nice to know who you're actually talking to so reach out and 
share the love. And most of all, until next time, be awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was